If you are new with us this morning, so glad that you're here. Um, we have prayed for you, and uh, we know that the Lord has brought you here, that we ask that God would bring people to himself, and you're a part of that today. Whether if you've been here a lot, or again, this is your, new, your first time here, welcome, and welcome to those of you who are online. We're so honored that you're with us today. And my prayer is that God would be speaking to us. Goodness, I've really enjoyed this service so far. Um, choir just brings me to tears, probably way more often than not. And uh, the focus with Margie and the songs, focusing on Christ, I really appreciate um, what God is doing here. And uh, last week, if you're with us, uh, Tom spoke. And Tom, where are you? Here, right here. Yeah. So great. So great. <clears throat> so grateful that uh, God has brought him and so many others to uh, bless us and to minister us. And a message comes out differently when you've been in ministry for decades than it does when you've been in ministry for weeks or days. And so it's a combination of love for the Lord, um, knowing his word with uh, practical experience that came forward and blessed my heart and our heart as well. And so I'm grateful for him and others that God has given us. And by the way, uh, if you haven't received our email as far as, you know, what's happening announcement-wise, also to that, we have a new slate or a, uh, an additional slate of candidates for our leadership council, including the shepherding team and the management team. Those things have been printed out, the bios, the pictures, these type of things are back in the Welcome Center back there. So if you're wondering and you want to pray for us and uh, you have questions or whatever, uh, please look at those, uh, that sheet. And in August 1st, those people will be included um, to our leadership council. And we really have some stellar, stellar folks here. So grateful for that as well. And if you will, continue to pray for next week. So if you're going to, I'm going to, I want to ask everyone, employ everybody here. Next week, every evening is our kids camp. And that happens from six o'clock to eight o'clock. And we have lots of people who are going to show up and be here. And again, if you can help us kind of rearrange down the fellowship hall after service, that'd be super helpful. Um, that we pray for our community, and in particular, we pray for children. Uh, if you think about your own story and most stories, most people come to faith or to Christ when they're young. And that's something for us to be cognitive of and saying, okay, it would be much better to, to reach people before they need to be rescued later on. And you understand that if you come to faith later on, um, you know, all the mistakes and things you have to unlearn. Not that ch kids who come into the faith don't have to <laughs> relearn some things as well, but it's important. So if you are not going to be physically present, I'm asking that you would pray, okay? So I don't, you know, whatever you need to do, put it on your phone as a reminder because you might not be thinking of kids camp if you're not here. I'm asking for you to pray and pray that God would draw kids to himself and families to itself. Pray for that. Pray that the messages and the community would be, um, we would be speaking the word of truth, primarily the gospel, along with people would feel the love of God in our hearts and, and through our interaction. Will you pray that way? And will you pray that God, again, will bring families to himself? So I'm asking all of us to participate, whether you're physically present and helping, and you can still do so, or if you're going to be not physically present, will you pray for this, in particular, this upcoming week? So you now have gainful employment at least for a week, and so please do that <laughs> this next week. All right. We're going to jump into our text. So we do have notes. Most of you know that these are available printed copies. Um, there should be, uh, they should be there this week. We got it out a little bit late, late online. So if it's not there, you'll be able to get it in the future. And so that hopefully will help us all to follow along because often we cover lots of things, lots of texts. It's hard to remember all of it. I get it. So hopefully those things will help. This morning, again, we're going to see Jesus as he is communicating who he is to those who are living in Jerusalem. And what strikes me, and as we're taking our time through the Gospel of John, Jesus makes incredibly audacious claims about himself. And also what would happen to us without him. It's strong and striking and startling language. 
what are we to make about who he is in what he says? Now, if you remember from a few weeks ago, uh, the Pharisees, which were the religious leaders of the day, were threatened by Jesus and were, were really out to get him, not just get him, but kill him. And they commissioned the temple guards, and they had this force there keeping order, like, you know, a police force uh, at the mall or whatever. But they had, you know, they had authority. They commissioned them to go and get Jesus as this big festival was happening, and he was teaching. And these guards came back, not with Jesus, but they said this about him. No one ever spoke the way this man does. This is John 7, 36. And that's really striking to me because as temple guards, their job was to be in quote-unquote church every single day. They have heard teaching after teaching after teaching from Pharisee to chief priest to all of these people every single day. They heard more religious teaching than anybody else because they're employed to be there, right? And they heard it perhaps drone on for days and weeks and months and years. And yet with all of that exposure to all of that religious teaching, they noticed there was a great contrast between the teachers of the law and Jesus. They said, no one speaks like that man speaks. And so I want us to pay attention to this. And some of us are familiar with the Bible. Some of us have been around it. Maybe you grew up in church. And some of us really don't know much about it. But I'm asking us to pay attention to the, who this man is. How he speak what he does. It's striking. It's powerful. And if what he's saying is true, it matters. It matters not just how we interact with one another. It matters when we die and for what happens next. So I'm asking us, I'm asking God to help us with this. Again, if either you're, you know, you're just here by accident, you would think, or you've been in church your whole life, I'm, I'm asking God, help us to see what you're saying here. And so we're going to uh, John chapter 8, verse 12. We're going to pick up the story. Uh, as Tom preached last week, there's this insertion of um, the, the woman or the couple caught in adultery, and we see Jesus' handling of people and of the law different than the teachers of the law. And then we come back to Jesus teaching in the temple, and he's making these claims like, I am the bread of life, and I am the living water. And we see right out of the gate another one of his audacious claims. This is what he says in John chapter 8, starting in verse 12. And I'm reading primarily out of the NIV version this morning. When Jesus spoke again to the people, verse 12 of chapter 8, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life, okay? We're just going to pause there and unpack this just a little bit. The main point here in this section, and I have four points, I believe, is this. I want us to, and God help us to understand Jesus' claim that he says, understand that Jesus is the light of the world. Now again, this is a really audacious, that's the best word I have, claim, it's stark saying, I 
am the light of the world. Now, what does that mean? Now, if you had read the book of John, the letter of John, the gospel of John, up to this point, you would have thought, wait a second, this imagery of light has been communicated and is impregnated in the chapters before this. If you remember, right in the beginning of this book, and if you have a Bible, a paper Bible, you can turn over, this is how this gospel started. I'm going to read it for us because it was like 20 weeks ago we were here, okay, to remind us of what John lays out by the Holy Spirit right away. This is how the book or the gospel of John starts. John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, stark, amazing claims. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the, here it is, light of men. Now the light, it shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. These are the opening words. John, empowered by the Holy Spirit, brought forth saying that Jesus is God and everything was created, was created through him, and he indeed is the light. And there's a contrast between the light and all other things, which is darkness, blindness, lostness. This contrast was set up right from the beginning. Now, if you continue to read the gospel and you read this and you're learning about Jesus, which I hope you are, you'll see then in John chapter 3 this interaction between Jesus and one of the ruling religious PhD level people named Nicodemus, and they have this dialogue about who Jesus is and about being born anew and being born again, and Jesus uses similar imagery talking about light and darkness. This is John 3, 18. This is for review for us to remember. This is what Jesus said to Nicodemus and also to us, and this is the judgment, the conclusion. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not want to be exposed, does not want to come to the light. Lest his or her works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his or her works have been carried out in God. Do you remember that? And then as we continue to read, and John continues to unpack about who this man is, and Jesus does things and says things, then we get to this point where Jesus says plainly, I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. I am. Am that light. Oh. He's saying that indeed he is God. He's saying, as he was teaching in this passage at night in a place that was well lit, that there was huge um, torches that were there, it was in the treasury area that was well lit. He says, Hey, I am the light the world. Now, if you're just exploring Christianity, you might have a positive opinion of Jesus, knowing some of his teaching. And if you're a Christian for a long time, you say, yeah, I know Jesus, but I want us to understand what he's saying here. I am the 
liked. And notice that Jesus didn't say that I am a light. Right? There's a difference. In us in this pluralistic society, we like to categorize Jesus uh, into a category of religious leaders, right? Well, Jesus is a light, but hey, Muhammad's a light, and Buddha's a light, and Confucius, or whoever you want to put in that category. Jesus didn't say, well, I'm a light. He says, I'm the only light. I am the light. This is significant. Which means without him, there's just darkness. Which means if we don't have him, we're spiritually blind and hopelessly lost. Like we say, we're desperate for him. When he says, I am the light, follow me. If you do, you will have indeed the light of life. So I have to ask us, like, who are you following? Or what are you following? What direction are you living your life? Who is your mm, model? Who is your, uh, what is your philosophy that you live life with? Please think about this. Who is leading you? And if you say, well, it's Jesus, I, I believe in, in Jesus, then get close to him. Some of us have been in church for a long time. We believe in Jesus, but we don't want to get too close, right? I believe in, yeah, can you still see the light? Yeah, I think it's out there. Yeah, there it is. Say we believe in Jesus, but we don't want to be that close, right? Kind of want to have one foot in or one foot out or kind of be on the edges a little bit. Now, I don't know if that's you and I don't know what's happening. I know a lot of us in here, right? But wouldn't it serve us better to be as close to him as we can? To walk in the light that we need for our life to take even the next step and for our eternity. We must think about this. And you and I and everyone, like everyone, has to do business with the claims of Jesus. You either believe in him and follow, or you do not. <laughs> now we see this contrast, and as we continue going in John, we'll see this clash between those who claim to be the children of God and the one who was the only begotten Son of God. They didn't come to him. They grew up around religion, but they were not in the boat. They were not in Christ. And again, why did they not come to Jesus? Jesus says, because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to be exposed. Right? Most bad things that happen, happen when no one's looking. Right? Night, or when everyone's out of the office, or when no one's home. Jesus saying that he's the light means that if you come to him, we're going to be exposed for who we are. He still says, come to me. I will forgive you. He doesn't say, hey, clean up your act before you come here because you're kind of gross. Right? Thank you, right? He doesn't say that. Come to me as you are. If you want life, if you want light, you 
been lost and bumping around and hurting yourself and other people, just come to me. I will heal you, I will forgive you, I'll make you new. You can walk in the light. This is the claim, that's the invitation. And let's continue to read here what he says. So the Pharisees were there in that crowd and they heard him make this claim, right? And I want us to skip by this claim. It's an amazing claim and they knew it as well. They didn't want to hear him. Even like the guards wanted to hear him. They wanted to kill him. So they were looking for a way to do so. So in verse 13, this is how that group of people responded to him. The Pharisees challenged him saying to Christ, so here you are, you're appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Okay? So what they were saying, and it's logical, right? Saying, oh, you say that you're the light of the world, but you can say anything you want. Is there anybody else or anything else that validates your claim, right? For instance, I can say that I was born in Minnesota, right? Or I can say I was born in Arizona or Wisconsin, right, or wherever. I can say that, but it doesn't mean that it's true, right? I can say with confidence I'm born in Minnesota. You know why? Because on my birth certificate, the doctor says I was born in Minnesota, right? My mom was there as well, right? <laughs> you can ask my mom. She'll tell you, yeah. That's when it happened, right? So you can verify what I have to say. So these guys are saying, yeah, Jesus, all right, you can say you're the light of the world, but your testimony is not valid because you're speaking against yourself. You can say that you're a monkey as well. That doesn't mean you're a monkey, right? What's the proof, right? So this is what they're challenging them. They weren't dealing with his claim, but they're like, well, I don't know if we can believe you, right? So how does Jesus respond to this. And this gets a little interesting, a little technical. So hopefully I can walk us through this well. This is how he responds, verse 14. So Jesus answered, well, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. He says, hey, even if I'm telling about yourself, myself, I know the truth, and it is valid, okay? But you... Pharisees, but you have no idea where I come from. You have no idea where I'm going. Verse 15, now you judge by human standards, okay? And we see this in the text. If you're with us for a number of weeks, it's there. Jesus says, judge by right standards. And Jesus said, you judge by human standards. Now I pass judgment on no one, at least at this point. But if I do judge, he says, my decisions are true. Because I'm not alone, okay? I stand with the Father. And that's the next point we'll just see next. I stand with the Father. I'm not alone, okay? I stand with the Father. He is the one who sent me, verse 17. Now, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. And the other witness is the Father. Who sent me? Okay. So this is the next point. I want us to consider this. Understand that Jesus stands with the Father. So Jesus' defense for his testimony about himself was saying, well, what I'm telling you is true. But if you ask and require a witness, I'm going to give you a witness. Right? It's God the Father. Right? He says... We stand together. We have always been together. And actually, he is the only one who knows where I came from because he was there with me. And by the way, I was always. Before all y'all were here, before anything that was created, was created, it was me, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So he is the only one that knows where I have come from. And by the way, he sent me. 
And so if you want to know, Jesus said, if I truly am the light of the world, you can believe me as one witness and also talk to the God you say you claim you worship. He knows as well. So my testimony and his testimony validates that I indeed am the light of the world. It's a great defense, but one they couldn't comprehend because who else was there to witness this besides the Father and the Holy Spirit? This is the right defense he could give. But you want to understand, again, here is another claim of Christ. Don't let this pass you by. He says, I stand with the Father. And these guys who claimed that they were serving God and claiming Moses as their authority, Jesus says, I stand with the Father. You can either believe that or, you're n- or not believe that. This is what Jesus claimed. Is this true? Does this matter? And indeed, I say it does. If you remember, the entire purpose of this gospel and the gospels themselves is to prevent, present evidence to us as to the identity of who this man Jesus is. And we know from John 20, 31, that the goal is that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. And that by believing in him, not just believing things about him, but placing our life in him, saying, I believe you are the I am, I believe that you are true, I give my life to you. If you do so, you will have life in his name. If you're on the edge, if you're a seeker, or Jesus is in your spiritual (laughs) bench, you know, one of many, I want you to think about this. What does that mean? He is one with the Father. He's the light of the world. Now, these Pharisees were like, eh, huh? <laughs> Verse 19. So they heard Jesus say this. Well, it's me and my father. We testify about this. We stand together. Then they asked him, um, where's your father, Jesus? <laughs> By the way, he had an earthly dad. His biology had nothing to do with with Jesus' existence, by the way. His name is Joseph. More than likely, Joseph had passed away at this point, right? But they were confused. Wait a second. What do you mean your father? (laughs) Where is your father? (laughs) Jesus replied by saying, well, you don't know me or my father, and said, if you knew me, you would know my father also. Another stark audacious claim, which means to know Jesus is to know the Father. And if you have Jesus, you have the Father. But you cannot have the Father, it's Father God, without the Son. And you cannot have the Son without the Father. They are different beings, but the only true God. Think about that. Now, there are many religions in our world. The biggest two are what? It's a test. What is it? Christianity, right? What's the next one? Islam. Right? There's Buddhists and there's Hindus and there's Jews, obviously, and there's, there's lots, of, lots of stuff. Right? The biggest ones, Christianity and Islam. What's the biggest difference? between Christianity and Islam? Jesus, that's the right answer. Now Islam, and this is not an anti-Islam message, this is just the reality message. Now, um, those in Islam hold Jesus to be a prophet. They don't 
see him as the son of God or God incarnate. That's a big deal. So how this plays out is, and I'm just pointing to this as an example, they say that they worship the Father. Right? They trace their lineage, as do the Jews, back to Abraham. Okay? It's a complicated, and you can read all this stuff, right? It's nothing new to some of us here. Right? They believe that they pray to the Father, which they call Allah. Scriptures refer to him in the Old Testament primarily as Yahweh, different ways. Okay, we see, we see Jesus being the Son and the Savior and all of this. It is impregnated in the Old Testament, seen all over the place, revealed in the New Testament. So when Jesus says, if you knew me, you would know my Father. If you come to him, you'll come to the Father, which means that if you marginalize Jesus, but claim you have God, you're a liar. That's significant. And this is what Jesus is, says, even to these Jewish people. He said, hey, you don't know me. Because you don't know me, you don't know the Father. You don't know who I am. You don't receive my testimony. You don't see me and know me and believe in me as the Messiah. So you think you have the Father, yet you do not have me, so that means you don't have the Father also. This is significant. Jesus is either telling the truth and speaking the truth, or he's lying. And he speaks lies. You have to deal with this. Again, I've been a pastor for a long time, working on three decades now. I have people who have listened to my uh, hundreds of sermons, decades. I have a conversation with them, and they think Jesus is a way among many ways. Is that what he says? (laughs) Thank you. How can you think that? You know why we want to think that way? Because if this is actually true, that means the world's got a problem. I would love it if everyone in the end just ends up in heaven with God. That'd be awesome. That's true. We wouldn't need a, what? Whatever. It doesn't doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't really even matter what you do. Actually, not really anything matters. Jesus goes on and talks about some stuff here that we have to look at. Verse 20. Let's continue to read this. Concludes this section. We're going into the next section. (laughs) Verse 20. So he spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts, like I noted earlier, near the place where the offerings were put. No one sees him, right? They're looking to. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. There was more that must be accomplished, right? Again, John grounds Jesus' teaching in reality. It happened in a certain place at a certain time. And the response in sovereignty that God was working. Now, verse 21, let's continue to read this. Now, once more, Jesus said to them, Now, I'm going away. And you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Oh, what? Now, where I go, you cannot come. By the way, this is sin singular at this point. You will die in your sin. What sin is he pointing towards? The sin is that people who saw him still, and he came, and he left, and he did leave, and he was crucified, that those people were still looking for the Messiah after the Messiah had come and gone. Sin of denying Christ. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. (laughs) Because where I go, you cannot come. And without Jesus, we cannot enter heaven. Now this made the Jews ask, what? Wait a second. Are you planning on killing yourself? (laughs) That is why he says, "Where where I go, you cannot come. Because they believed if you killed yourself... Right? 
you're going to hell. This is what they believed. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that this is what they believed. But he continued. You are from below. Another claim, I am from above. Now you are of this world. I am not of this world. Verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. Now plural expansion of this. If you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. So the point being, this claim is, understand that without Jesus, you and I will die in our sins. Without Jesus, you will die in your sins. I just want that to sink in a little bit. Right? So that's super heavy. In America, we tend not to want to talk about sin because it makes people feel uncomfortable. We need to be uncomfortable with the reality of our hearts. Jesus talked about it. It's an issue. It's an issue for me. It's an issue for all of us because we are of the world. We're bent towards sin and we trespass God's law is perfection. We don't live as he made us to be. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe what? That I am. That, by the way, is the Greek. The he was added in by the editors, by the way. I get why they did it, because they want to point to, I am he, the one that I've been claiming about. So Jesus is saying, hey, you'll die in your sins if you don't believe that I am. That I am God. This is important. Right? When he says he's from above, he is from above, because he is above all things. And we in the world are saturated in sin. It's like we're living in Chernobyl, right? Where that thing blew up. Remember that? There's radiation everywhere. Everyone within its plume got sick, was going to die, and did die in some pretty awful ways. We're all contaminated with sin, and we're all going to die in it. And Jesus, as the life raft, Jesus as the light, Jesus as the Savior, Jesus as the Creator, Lord, came in to our nuclear fallout and says, follow me, I'll lead you out. This is the only way out, but you have to follow me. And he invites us. I can cleanse you from the sickness of sin. I can make you new. Or you can get new life. I am the life. Follow me. This is what he says. This is our condition. And without him, we radiate. We've been absorbed the radiation of sin. It permeates everything of us, and we cannot clean ourselves, only He can. This is what Jesus is saying, and this is like significant. It's weighty, it's hard, but it's full of life and truth, saying, I am the light. Do you believe? Will you believe? Not just adding Jesus to your life, but making Jesus the center of your life. Instead of identifying as X, Y, and Z, you identify as a Christian first and foremost. I'm a Christian. Unfortunately, I think in our modern day American Western preaching, 
We see Jesus as the great fixer of my messes, and I'll come to you again when I have a problem, but don't mess with me. It's not the gospel. The gospel has come to me, Jesus says. We don't. The reality is, because of our choices, we'll die in your sin. So the Pharisees heard this, right? And Jesus is like pouring it on, he's pouring it on, he's pouring it on. We'll see this confrontation with them get stronger and stronger and stronger until they ultimately kill him in the sovereign timing of God when he said, okay, now's the time. They responded in verse 25. They said, who are you? <laughs> they asked. They obviously did not know. <laughs> Jesus says, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Jesus replied, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy. What I have heard from him, I tell the world. Now, verse 27, they did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. That's the Greek, I am. And that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Significant statement. Understand, Jesus is one with the Father. Okay? This was his and is his claim. This is huge. So they finally asked him, like, who are you? And he doesn't say, well, I'm the Messiah. But he says he's the Messiah, right? And they get this. Right? When they asked him who he was, he said, I've been telling you, and when I speak, I speak from God and for God and as God. He says, when I am lifted up, right? He's talking about when I am crucified. Then you will see that I am he. Seen in the scriptures, prophesied by the prophets, tested to, by the Spirit seen among all people. When that happens, you'll know. It says, I am the Son of Man, a title taken from Daniel chapter 7. Right? I am, harking back to the burning bush with Moses, who they lifted up, Jesus is saying, I am the Son of God. I am the Christ. This is what I came to do, to save my people from their sins. When I am lifted up, you'll know that I and the Father are one. I do the will of the Father. I have the heart of the Father. He is with me. I am with him. I am one with the Father. That's significant. And then in conclusion, John says, verse 30, even as he spoke, many believed in him. So I'm asking us a question. This isn't a question between you and me, <laughs> not a question between you and your spouse or your kids or your grandmother or your mom or whatever. It's a question between you and Christ, you and the Father. Who do you believe he is? Given the evidence, not just from this message, but all of these messages and in the Gospels, if you're not sure yet about Jesus or if you're new to this whole thing, read the Gospels. Start there. This is a good one. Right? They're all good. Read it. And decide. I often do not pray for revival. I'm starting to pray that way. I'm just being honest. 
I'm starting to pray, God, work here among us. Work here in Rockford. That God would bring people to himself. They would they understand who this is. This gospel is evangelistic by nature as it reveals things about Christ. And we're going to see tons of stuff. And there's stuff, obviously, for believers and non-believers. But it points in Christ to say, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? Really? If you say that I believe he is the Christ, then go to him. Cling to him. Like a dying person uh, outside of a raft in the middle of the sea and someone throws you a life preserver, grab onto it. Not just, yeah, I'm going to add it in. I hope it all works out in the end. <laughs> Do my thing. Okay. I'll get to it later. Really? Yeah, I want to see, but I'm enjoying being blind. Well, you can see right now. Nah. I'll do it later when I'm about to die. Don't be so foolish. How do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Right? Your heart might stop tonight. Do you know what's going to happen? You know, if you pull out here in State Street and a big truck comes rumbling down the hill that you're not going to get hit? Walk, look both ways, by the way, because people do, that does happen right here. Why are you waiting? <laughs> well, I like to be miserable. Great. Wow. You don't have to be. But seriously. Think about this. And you say, you know what? I believe. <laughs> Just like these people. As he spoke, many believed in him. All right. Pray. Tell them. Ask for forgiveness. And get about living in the light. And those of you who claim to be in the light, if you're sleeping, wake up. Wake up. We're called to be carriers of the light, just like Margie challenged us this morning. Take these things seriously. Without Christ, we are all dead in our sins. Think about that. So let's talk to Christ right now. He is here with His Spirit. So Jesus, here we are. Um, gather in this place. Lord, I know your Spirit's here. You've heard everything I've said that we've talked about. God, I do pray, Father, that your word would be, um, I don't know, buried in our heart. Pray for all of us, God, that we would think about you truly and judge rightly. So, God, I'm asking... There's people here that, man, the first day in church today, right? God, that they would believe. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's been people that have like always been in the church. But you are not the center of their life. You're on the periphery somewhere. May that shift take place. Recognition that you are Lord. And for thus, those who are following after you, God, I say that help us to honor you and worship you and live for you more. And do that in us by your Spirit. We need your help, God. So have your way among us. We recognize Christ that it's in you alone that we are saved because indeed you are the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.